So we have learned thus far about how families work. Everything from the different types of families that exist to family stories and the roles that they play. But what about maintaining family relationships? I mean, if you're related to them, shouldn't it be easy? I think you know well enough by now to know that no relationship is easy. It takes some work to maintain it. So we need to engage in some of the same maintenance strategies that we would use for other relationships we have. Keep in mind that we create our families through how we communicate. There's definitely our families of blood. There's also our families of connection that we develop through how we communicate with them. One of the ways that we can communicate is with positivity. This means that we show either an upbeat or maybe even hopeful approach to our communication, saying kind words, talking about the good things, if someone's feeling down, trying to cheer them up. We can also engage in assurances. Remember that assurances are telling your family members how much they mean to you. Doing small things here and there that let, lets them know that you are very deeply excited and that you love them and that you are joyful that you can be a part of their family, your family. Also keep in mind that it's important to engage in some ethical self-disclosure. Now we've talked about self-disclosure in several different chapters throughout, so I won't go into too much detail about self-disclosure, but it is also important to think about how sharing our private thoughts and feelings with family members really helps them feel a connection to us. As we learned very early on, self-disclosure can lead to more intimacy, which is just a nice word for saying connection. Additionally, the more you self-disclose with your family members, it allows them to do the same thing without this fear of, well, is it okay for me to self-disclose? What if they betray me and tell all my business out there to everybody else? This is one of those situations where self-disclosure will be reciprocal. It's also important, especially in this day and age, think about how technology can help or even hurt with family maintenance. Hopefully it's helping. Online communication should be in addition to our face-to-face, -face, not the only type of communication that we have. Right now, it is, as I'm recording this video, 2020, and the world's in a pandemic. So it may be that a lot of your face-to-face -face interactions with family members have gone completely online. Some so for the fact that you're too far away, or maybe just overall safety. So in a normal everyday life, when there's no pandemic, then yes, your online communication should go with the face-to-face. -face. But as you can see now, it's really helpful that we maybe just turn on our camera and see our family members' faces and still have a connection with them, even when we can't physically be with them. It's also going to be helpful for geographically separated families. Right now, I am about five hours away from my sister, and she is my closest family member. So to have this online communication, whether it be social media, or Zoom, or any other type of video conferencing, it helps us feel connected. And sometimes just seeing her face helps me feel like the old times when we could be closer together, even though it's only a virtual face-to-face. -face. Now, relational dialectic theory, which we've talked about in the past, also works with our families. If you remember from the past, we've talked about how relational dialectics is basically just contrary tendencies or are opposing values that work in relationships. We've talked about how there's the dialectic of autonomy and connection, how there's privacy and protection, openness and protection, and how there's novelty and routine. In particular, when it comes to your family, it's important to think about the autonomy and connection as well as openness and protection. So starting off with autonomy and connection, we can definitely feel a struggle 
we want to feel connected to our family members. We want to let them know that we are part of the family, but we also want our own separate identities. This is going to be very important for any of you who have teenagers. During that time, teenagers are even more likely to push away and want their autonomy and less so to feel that connection. But even the most angsty teenager still wants to feel some type of connection to their healthy family. Overall, we've said that it's important to try to find the balance between autonomy and connection. This can mean maybe balancing different tasks. So chores around the house, maybe even emotional tasks, not just having one particular family member be the one that you unload all of your emotions onto, but that you feel like you can share those emotional, that emotional work. In addition, it's important to cultivate your social networks. So any family member should always feel like they should have a good social network outside of just the family. One, this is gonna help that autonomy part. But additionally, if there is a breakdown at any point in the communication between family members, there is someone outside who can also be a support. When it comes to openness and protection, we also have to think about how we want to self-disclose. We want to share with our family members, but we also want to protect from any possible consequences of that sharing. I know there's moments where I want to just talk to my mom and say, mom, these are all the horrible things that are happening in my life right now. Can you just be my mom and help me get through it and tell me everything's going to be okay, even though I know maybe they won't always be just okay. Even as an adult, I still have that desire to be open and try to share with my mom. But there's always those moments where I know once I share, she now knows this information and I have to deal with the consequences of my sharing. So there are times where I may be pulled back and don't want to share and I protect that information. This is where communication privacy management theory is going to come into play. Basically, it's a to explain the theory in the, sh the easiest way is where individuals create some informational boundaries. You don't have to share information that you're not ready to share. And you need to choose carefully what kind of information, especially when that's private information that you want to reveal. Also think about who you want to share it with. I have several family members that I know I cannot tell my business to because they will become public knowledge to every single family member if I share it. So I engage with establishing some boundaries to where they can't have that information until I'm ready for the entire family to know. Now, as with any relationship, there's definitely gonna be some family relationship challenges. Some of those challenges can be maybe in a step family. This is gonna be extremely hard for adolescents who have gotten used to their family of origin and the dynamics that happen there. They could feel like, oh, now there's these new people in my life that I have to adjust to. They could engage into some triangulation. So triangulation is when a coalition is formed, uniting one family member with another against a third person causing loyalty conflicts. So in the case of the Brady Bunch, where maybe the boys are like, oh, we need to team up with dad. And the girls are like, well, we need to team up with mom. Well, these are going to form those coalitions to where in a case of an argument or a fight, everyone's picked a side. So it's important to think about how that dynamic, how that feeling loyalty to one particular family member over another is going to hurt the overall family. You also need to think about parental favoritism. So this could be where maybe one or both parents truly do maybe show a little bit more favoritism towards one child over the other. Now there's gonna be different reasons for that. While one parent may treat a, a particular child differently, it could be that child maybe needs more. It could be honestly that the, the parent just likes the kid more. Sometimes personality is a big factor, but if you feel or if a, someone you know feels like their one parent has favorited another child over them or if they are the favorite child, 
then you know how harmful it can be and how it can stress out the relationship. And this is really gonna affect more so the sibling relationship. So those brothers and sisters and how they connect with each other. I would say if you are in a situation where you're a parent, definitely making sure that you're trying your best to balance out and addressing all your children's needs. And if you are the child in this case, or maybe you and your siblings can feel the favoritism, maybe addressing that with your parents. Then there's gonna be the interparental conflict. So overall, we do genuinely expect that the parents will be maybe in control of the situation, that no matter what, we can just think, oh, everything should be fine and dandy. Parents may, may maybe not handle their conflict the best way. So in a, interparental conflict refers to overt, hostile interactions between parents and a household. It's gonna be the yelling, the screaming, maybe even abuse that can occur. It's important that we think about how devastating this is for the children. Children don't really know how to handle conflict because they're still new to the world. So it's important that because they are still new and kind of learning how to handle conflict from their parents, that parents in this case address conflict in healthy ways and model how to address those conflicts in healthy ways. There is a spillover hypothesis, and this poses that the emotions, effect, and mood from the parent relationship can spill over into the broader family, which can disrupt the children's sense of emotional security overall. So if the parents are fighting and angry all the time, then the kids will be upset and angry all the time. If you are in education dealing with children, then you have a sense that one angry child that seen fine just last week may just have to be dealing with something at home and this could be maybe some interparental conflict now as we've looked over all this information we know that families are important we know that families can have struggles we have to think about the overall primacy of the family no matter who your family is no matter who your family has come to be the quality of your family relationships is defined by whether you invest time and energy into your interpersonal communication and also how they invest their own time. It's important that if you want a better family dynamic, that you're doing that work. You can't expect for mom and dad, our brother, sister, husband, wife to just feel a connection if you're not also putting in the time and energy into that interpersonal communication. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about all the different ways that families communicate with each other. I've heard it said best that families are our biggest source of joy. Families are our biggest source of pain. Families are super important for how we navigate this world. Family members, especially our parents, can be our very first teachers, showing us all the great things of the world, but also all the negative things of the world. So it's very important that as we are developing our interpersonal skills, that we are also thinking about how we use those skills to relate to the people who are related to us and are the people who've come into our lives as alternative families. <laughs>